Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Corey Clothier. Corey is the CEO of Arebo, a company that aids end users in autonomous vehicle deployment. Corey, welcome to the pod. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I look forward to it. I'm sure it's going to be fun. Let's uh, let's get into a little bit about what Arebo does. So you were talking to me before we started, and I kind of cut you off because I wanted to hear about it live. Um, <laughs> tell me a little more about Arebo. Okay. Well, we're a small consulting firm, and I say small, really small. Um, it's my daughter and I, our partners. Awesome. Um, and we've been working together for, I think, six years now, something like that. But she's been in the autonomous space for about nine. She took a gap year to, between her sophomore and junior year and was a demonstration manager for one of the autonomous shuttle companies oh, cool. for a year. And then I've been, I started in late 2008 with the Department of Defense as a strategic innovation consultant for, uh, it was called TARDAC back in the day, but it was uh, Engineering Research and Development Center for Ground Vehicles. And Badass. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. And I helped them with creating a, a long-term strategy for their autonomous research and development investments and, and strategy. And then I stayed there. I parked myself there for almost seven years. Is that the same as what's the Ground Vehicle Systems Center today? It is. It is, yes. Cool. Yeah, it's a great facility. Yep. I got on, lucky enough to get on base last time I was in Detroit. and su- yeah. Super neat neat operation there. Yep, so that was the start. So and we've I kind of used that as the initial model. And I actually, Rebo started as a program through Tardec that I was one of the co-developers of. And what we do is we help in both end users and autonomous developers. So the end users, we help them with planning and deployment, and all the, all of the consulting stuff that a lot of people don't even know needs to be done. Of course, you have to have your strategy, but feasibility studies and risk assessments and safety frameworks and on and on and on, concepts of operation, all of that homework and background information. So we do all of that. But then we also work with the end users. Mostly it's go-to-market strategy, de- business development strategy. But I don't like just to do strategy. I like to execute. So, you know, we'll help them build um, their strategy and then actually help them enter the market. And, you know, a lot of strategic connections and That's pilot awesome. projects, and all that fun stuff. It's so, been a lot of fun. It's been 15 years. Yeah. It almost sounds like if I'm getting it right, and 15 years is an amazing amount of time to be in business or in, even in an industry. So congratulations on that. But it sounds like you're welcome. You're doing like a combination of like product management, like systems engineering, and then like actual execution support. So like helping companies, you know, make the right contacts to actually deploy vehicles in the field. Is that is that roughly it? Yep. Sweet. Yep. Perfect. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) That sounds like it. Sounds like a great business. What are some of the differences in like an on-road like deployment versus an off-road? Because I've only really got any experience at all with the latter. So I'm kind of curious to hear about, you know, how that ticks and ties against the former. The stakeholder groups are different. I mean, and you have to start dealing with the public and the politicians and the regulators. So, and so policy is one of the big ones. Um, you know, and when it, most of the off-road is on private land or federal land is at least the projects that we've worked on. Cool. Um, which is, you know, you, you get the base commander's um, approval for, uh, you know, on a military base and you're good to go versus if you're going to be in Glendale, California, you know, <laughs> think of all the, all the hoops you have to jump through of all the, in, in, in kind of interesting, even I, I just popped in my head of like San Francisco, so, you know, all of the challenges that San Francisco has had. But one of, one of the things I think is interesting is there's like three or three regulatory bodies kind of in charge of the autonomous vehicles, it, but none of them are really responsible. It's, it's kind of odd. So, the complexity for an on-road is it's exponentially higher. That makes a lot and, of sense to me. And we mostly work off-road because of that. So Same here. the technology, yeah, <laughs> the technology, <laughs> exactly. So we'll, we'll help 
with on road we've done quite a bit of on road um, projects but we don't seek it out it, it falls in our lap but uh what we actively work on is things like that would be a military bases airports large industrial campuses things like that that's really what, where we want to work logistics campuses because mainly because there's a couple of things one is i think the technology is ready and the business case is ready we're yeah, that makes a not, lot of sense. Not so sure about on road yet. You don't have to worry you about know, some get, random person. <laughs> yeah, not as we don't have to worry as much. But that, right. the, so that's some of the things we we do. Like you think of it in on on road risk assessment. We do a pretty robust ODD assessment that um, incorporates a quantified risk assessment that I'm pretty ODD. proud of. Yeah, the what is that operational design operational design domain. The, Got it. The the environment. Yep. The, that the the autonomous vehicle will operate in. Cool. You know, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I guess all my autonomous vehicle work has been involved in like commercial construction and mining, pretty much. Right. So all all off road. The great thing about mining is, you know, because it's a controlled site, you can get people to wear RFID tags. You can use to localize personnel. Which I mean, you can't do that if you don't have, you know. Yeah. In, in a normal environment, <laughs> so. Yep. Your camera systems yeah, have to be a lot more robust. And pedestrians are one of the biggest issues. I mean, we, I mean, the most recent, you know, high profile accident was a pedestrian right in San Francisco with Cruz. Previous to that was probably the, the fatality with Uber in um, Chandler, Arizona. So yeah. both of them, you know, pretty, pretty bad, but both of them also breaking traffic rules. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge. The pedestrians are tough, especially if they're, if they're jaywalking or, you know, if they're not following norms. And but that's, we all have to deal with that. We have to deal with it as manual drivers. We have to deal with the autonomous developers. It's just the reality, right? But yeah. it is tough. Pedestrians are, are, are the tough one. Yeah, no, that is wild. I mean, I can only imagine trying to account for all those different edge cases and corner cases and, you know, the, the wild as it were, you know, just with yeah. people doing people things, um, yep. in Vegas for CES. And I saw, I think it was a billboard for, I don't know if it was for Aurora or if it was for some other self-driving car company, it might've been a different one. Cause it was the, the tagline was, was probably emotional. Emotionally. I think you're right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, it was a picture of like an Elvis impersonator on a uh, riding scooter running like a stoplight and it said trained in Vegas, ready for anything. You know? <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. So pretty funny. I mean, I love going down these, these geeky rabbit, rabbit holes because this is what we do is um, one of the ODD assessments that we did was actually for Vegas. So awesome. we, they were looking at operating autonomous shuttles in their medical district and they have some federal money for that. So we did a, you know, used our tools to quantify risk. And my daughter was actually one of the people running the assessment. So we put up, we took their traffic camera data. We put up our own static uh, kind of intersection cameras. And then we ran um, vehicles on the routes hundreds of times with dash cams and then dropped it all into our kind of, you know, our big data analytics engine. It was the company's actually called D-Risk and they quantify risk based on edge cases. Oh, well, that's interesting. And it, it was it's fascinating. So what they claim is that they can identify all of the edge cases within an operating all of them? Um, area. All of them. That's their claim. You know, I, I don't know what percentage they might, you know, plus or minus 0.1% or something. Sure. I don't think they actually say that, but I'm, I'm sure <laughs> if we pushed him, he would probably give us a percentage. But in how they do it is... They, they look at every piece of data they can get their hands on, all of the, the video data, traffic, you know, publicly available accident data, if the, the city's willing to share any any other incident or accident data that they might have. And they they put it all into their their big analytics tools and, you know, run their AI and their algorithms on it. And they come up with, it really looks like a kind of a, a brain model or a, a, um, kind of a, neural network because the the founder chess stetson he's uh this phd from caltech is actually in computational neuroscience cool so of course of course his his database looks like a brain it's like a neural network that's awesome and, and it's but it's all edge cases within this millions and millions of them 
and then they use that as their test profile um, construct. And the way the way they test from the hardest problems, you know, um, on down, it, it's really really cool. But you know, from from just the systems engineering, field engineering side, what we are able to build is at least risk heat maps, so we can say, you know, here are some really risky areas. And one of them was there was a common area where um, it was actually mostly homeless people across the street where there wasn't a pedestrian cross, Jeez. essentially jay jaywalking. But it was a really common spot, but nobody knew it until we collected the data and analyzed it. And so then we were able to, you know, we look at the mitigation strategies. We say, do we need to put a crosswalk there? Would it help? Do we put up signage? Do we just slow the cars down before they get there? You know, we just start to look at it, make sure there's no other visual obstruction. So, you know, there's not they're not coming out from behind a tree right when they step into the street things like that. And and then of course, then they use the data to actually work with the autonomous vehicle companies to train in simulation, all the ed edge cases that we found. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at www.ska.solutions. I don't know. I mean, we all make mistakes. Like, I mean, we blew up, like, how many yeah. rockets before we got one into orbit? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, But, know. you know, it's, for the most part, though, they did it safely. There weren't humans standing next to the rockets, you know, taking measurements and, you yeah. know, saying, hey, this thing is vibrating weird. <laughs> Maybe we should step back. Huh. <laughs> yeah. But that's a good point. And then that's a big you know, and that's a big thing that we also push is that yes, we're gonna make mistakes, but we don't have to make catastrophic mistakes. We know better. I like we that. know we know how to, to set up proper proper safety frameworks and safety mechanisms and, and items like that. We we have great best practices from you know, from our military, from NASA, from the automotive industry, et cetera, et cetera. And we know how to do things safely. So let's let's put in the right safety protocols and processes and tools and you know, let's not make mistake by hurting you know, hurting each other, hurting people or, you know, God forbid killing somebody. So Yeah. Yeah. Let's make small let's make small mistakes. Yeah, yeah. That are just it costs a couple of dollars and this you know, they slowed the project down a little bit and nobody got hurt. It's okay to lose a machine, don't lose a person. Yeah. So what are some of the other innovations in, in just safety engineering? I mean, I've worked with safety engineers, but my world's more like systems, electrical, mechanical, mm -hmm. a little bit of software, but not as much. So safety is fascinating to me. Yeah, and, and I'm really not an expert other than we, we I work with a, a guy named Andy Smart. He's my safety guru. So anything related to safety, I bring Andy in. And, cool. you know, great name, obviously, Andy yeah. Smart. Um, <laughs> He, he talks really funny. He's, I think he's Scottish. <laughs> no, he, he tease him. He's been in the U S for decades, but he's, he still has that, that thick Scottish accent. But Andy was, you know, he was a automotive and safety engineer for years, but you know, his, as he kind of matured in his career, he was the chief technology officer for SAE oh, cool. society of automotive engineers. And he was in charge when, they define all the levels of autonomy. And then he was the CTO of American Center for Mobility, one of the first proving grounds for connected autonomous vehicles in Michigan. And um, so he essentially designed that entire space, but he still chairs multiple safety standards committees glo you know, globally and things like that. So he's the expert. I am a, I am a novice, maybe a power user um, in the safety space. So, but we, we kind of collaborated and and he probably more educated me than anything else is that you know we were really we really look at a holistic safety case for just about everybody we we do this actually with kind of again both sides with the end users and with the av developers so one adv developer we'll, we're potentially going to start working with we've actually done this with a couple is we help them create an entire holistic safety program but it's it's like everything it's functional safety operational safety cyber security but it goes also into the whole safety culture of their company and helping them build a safety management system, safety frameworks, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really this holistic package. And so 
I believe in that. I think that, because that's where I came from out of the Marine Corps. And I think also the automotive companies are pretty damn good at that. I, you know, what, after I left the Marine Corps, I was an automotive engineer for a while and I was in the test world. I was working for both Ford and GM and different testing environments. And, and so, you know, their safety protocols and processes were solid. Um, but yeah, Andy's my, Andy's the man. Um, we, I, and then, I tend to find the, the good partners of for tools that we need, you know, like D-Risk. And there's another co- company called Street Scope that we work with. And they just have a different measurement for traffic hazards. And we kind of layer D-Risk and Street Scope together oh, cool. to give us a full full picture of the, the ODD, the risk assessments. And then what else we use? Icarus is our operational safety tool. And then, you know, if we go, if we go big and comprehensive, then Andy leads that entire holistic project. That's awesome. I joined the Marine with Marines with the goal of being a fighter pilot. And, uh, you know, it was the childhood dream. I had a academic scholarship and then, and I was raised by a single mom. So it was great that I had free college. Right. And, and, you know, she felt like, okay, he did it. He's there. I I got one out the door and into school. (laughs) Nice. And, uh, so I lasted a semester and, (laughs) And right when I went back to for the second semester, I started talking to the recruiters and I joined, um, I enlisted in the Marines with the, with the idea that I would, they would put me through school. Um, I would become an officer, you know, I would enlist first and then they would put me through college and I would become an officer. Then I would be a pilot and blah, blah, you know, and we had it all mapped out, me and the recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, I went home. I think it was February. So it was, you know, I'm like six weeks into my second semester, went home for the weekend and told my mom, laid out all my paperwork, told her I enlisted in the Marines. <laughs> I thought she, she was kick my ass. <laughs> she, was, she was ready to kick my ass, a little five foot four. <laughs> and I, I remember the quote she said really aggressively and loudly, you're the stupidest smart kid that's ever lived. And uh, she goes, you know, it's all a lie. It's never going to happen. So um, I went in like right after Christmas that year. So, I, you know, I had almost a year of dwell time and it actually worked out exactly the way we mapped it out. Nice. The way it worked. It was hard. You know, nothing was guaranteed in boot camp. They ask you what you want to do in the Marines, you know, and everybody, somebody, I want to be a truck driver. I want to be a mechanic. I want to be a, a grunt. You know, I want to be an inf- infantry. And I said, I want to be a jet pilot. And they're like, you're in the wrong place. Son. <laughs> Why don't you join the Air Force? Yeah. <laughs> or or just being enlisted. Oh, you know, I gotcha. That's not a that's not a path. <laughs> and uh so it was pretty funny because some of the drill instructors were super supportive. You know, they would just they would call me out, make me do extra push ups and and stuff, you know, as they yelled at me and told me I was never gonna make it. Very uh was an officer and a gentleman. Like you'll, you'll never amount to anything. You'll <laughs> never make it. And uh, but then they would call me a call me in in you know into like the back room or something and say, "Are you serious about this?" And I'm like, "You know, sir, yes, sir." And I say, like, "Okay, we're gonna get the captain to come talk to you." And, I was like, and then you know, a day or two later, the captain calls me. And same thing. You always think you're in trouble. You know, Claudia, you're getting here. I get it. Go in and. Shut the door, and then they talk like normal people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of you out. That's, that's awesome. He's like, so, so how's it going? You know, you scored, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, you scored really high on this. We'd like to encourage you to do this. Here's the path. And then, you know, as soon as you, oh, the door opens again, the screaming and yelling starts again. But they're that's really, hilarious. really supportive. That's awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. They're really cool guys. You know, it's positive and negatives. I feel like I potentially kind of wasted one of the slots because I, I didn't become a marine corps aviator because when i started to do it i found that i didn't really like it that much because it was a childhood dream and it was just too repetitive for me i did well i i finished kind of at the top of my class on every phase and i got juts but i just didn't it didn't feed my soul that was, makes sense it was, yeah it just and uh and as i was looking at finishing flight school and then signing up for the next six years to be a pilot and then looking at it for a career it's just like ah. I don't. I, I knew it wasn't a fit, um, but it was a great adventure. You know, yeah, great awesome. friends, and glad I did it. 
Yeah, I think I think last time uh, we talked about it, you mentioned like going up, and then they let you play with the jet, you know, and you just didn't feel like it, and so just like yeah. returned it. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I did my mandatory maneuvers, and and then I went back into the landing pattern for the rest of the time. But yeah, yeah, I remember looking at my watch. God, geez, forty five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That, but it hit me. It's like I went home and talked. To my, I married my high school sweetheart. You know, we've oh, been awesome. best friends since we were since we were teenagers. So I remember going home and telling her that because she was so excited for me. And she's like, "It's so exciting." And I was like, mm. "I was like, let me, let me tell you, you know, my perspective, my my story." And she was the same thing. She was looking at me like, "Huh? We worked really hard to get here." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But. I mean, sometimes you don't want to do the thing, place. you know, like that's, yeah. I, um, I'm oh, sorry, after you, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, I was just thinking, just, I was just reflecting on how amazing she is, how much she supported me through all of those journeys. Cause they're stressful going through every phase in the Marine Corps to get to, to the flight school. And, and, you know, we we're kids. I mean, we, she, we got married. I was 20, she was 18. And, oh, wow. uh, and then for it to change that dramatically and her still to be incredibly supportive. And, and she still is after all these years. That's so awesome. Been, we've been together for 40 years, I think, this year. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah right. Nobody does that anymore. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're yeah. thinking about kids and, and kind of back into the technical side is thinking about just the differences in from generation to generation now that, that you know with our technology how fast it's developing i spent the last two weekends i did one with my granddaughter then last weekend just a couple of days ago I, on saturday spent a lot of time with my grandson on chat gpt and gemini and we were making t-shirts oh, cool. um, using ai graphics and image generators that's awesome for our, for our company so just so much fun but just thinking about this is their reality now <laughs> is having these AI it's just tools. a tool they grew up with yeah <laughs> like the same yeah. way we're dicking around with basic you know and and he was then he um i let him sign into my account on his ipad he downloaded a bunch of of the add-ons and plugins for chat gpt and was playing with a bunch of them he created a logo for us in five minutes he goes hey i made a logo for your company pop up and and then was just doing research. I mean, just awesome. he was, and he was loving it. He was just going to town. He's ten. And That's amazing. Now, yeah. Do you end up so using the logo? It, no, we already had one. Ah, oh, fair enough. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But but I love that he he was doing it. I got a we good press release to, person. If you want to rebrand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, but the T-shirt is amazing, and uh, I'll show it to you when yeah. it comes in. We ordered we ordered T-shirts that he designed. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so cool. Like it's, have you have you seen the videos? What's the new one? The the video platform from OpenAI. It's Yeah, yeah. It starts with a V. I can't remember what it's called. Um, yeah. That was wild. I don't like, remember either. But yeah, I've seen them too though. I don't think they've I don't think they've released it to the public yet. Like you can't like go in and play with it, but I mean, think about the amount of money it must cost just to like make one of those. Like I think some of us like 13 bucks or something per video which is pretty incredibly low compared to a video editor. I know what I pay to get this yeah. podcast edited. Sorry, Carl, I don't mean to throw you under the bus, but like <laughs> it's more than that. <laughs> you know? yeah. so, um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like that'll unlock, you know, just so much in terms of every single like, you know, documentary that you see on the history channel is going to have some kind of AI generated, like, you know, yeah. cowboy gunfight or whatever. And, like pirate duel. I don't know. Like just yeah. all sorts of stuff. I feel like, you know, you'll be able to, just quickly come up with that way. So what other things, I guess, are you excited about, like in robotics these days? I mean, it sounds like, I mean, like we've done pretty great historically as a society, I feel like, at making stuff, like better than we've ever done in all of human history, it turns out, you know. Yeah, where we're yeah. At. But what are some of the recent developments you've been watching, like, you know, stuff, you know, you think will probably come out soon or like stuff that you think will get more popular that maybe, you know, not as many people have noticed yet or. Oh yeah. That, that's actually, that's, that's kind of all I talk about and all I work on is those things that are kind of in the shadows that people don't realize are going to impact their lives someday. So I, I like kind of in two categories. One is 
the things that enable us and you don't know that they're even doing it. And that could be like uh, airports, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles, moving cargo. We have no idea. Right. And, uh, and we don't really care as long as our luggage shows up or the, you know, our package <laughs> is delivered that time. So that stuff excites me because it has impact and it's going to improve efficiency and there's, there's labor shortages everywhere. And so those are kind of neat. Those things that are, are backstage kind of, but I also am excited about the things that we're going to interact with, like delivery vehicles. I think that's super cool. You know, there's what is there a dozen sidewalk delivery robots out there, and some of them are getting a little more sophisticated where they can climb stairs and they have little rollers or some kind of a, a, a package, uh, I was saying package dumping device, but that doesn't quite sound right. But yeah. <laughs> it you know, actuation, or something know. To you, be able to, do you want to like a big yeah. word for it? <laughs> like, yeah, it could be actuation. One of them was, um, yeah, it was kind of like a robotic arm that, which is some of the drones use something like that too. kind of have an end effect or a claw. It's a reverse claw machine, drop, you know, drop your package and then leave. <laughs> but those are, those are super cool. I, I think being able to order a pizza and have it come in a robot yeah. or, you know, whatever, you know, might come in a drone and be dropped off in my front yard. I think those are super fun. So, um, yeah, I feel like uh, we might we might be at a good kind of natural stopping point here. Well, I appreciate it. This was fun. No, I had a blast. Um, anything you want to plug on the way out? No, I think we told our story. Right. Good. Sweet. Well, uh, thanks for coming on, Corey. I appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to doing it again sometime. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at www.ska.solutions. Thanks again, and 